Thursday was Ascension Day. Many do not realize that this day is part of our Christian calendar, and few celebrate it. But last Saturday, I went to an Amish market with my daughter in Chester County, and on the entrance, sign on the door said that they would be closed on Thursday because of Ascension Day. Thursday was Ascension Day. Today is considered Ascension Sunday. And while many may not observe this day, clearly it's important to our Amish brothers and sisters, and it should be important to all Christians. So exactly what is this day? Well, after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, he was on earth for 40 more days. He assured his disciples that he was alive and he appeared to them on several occasions. He gave them various instructions, and he promised them that the Holy Spirit would come to them. On this 40th day after Jesus' resurrection, they went to the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem. Jesus rose into the sky and disappeared into a cloud. Then two angels appeared to the disciples and told them that Jesus had gone to heaven. We may not think about ascension often, but every time we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, we say he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. The disciple knew Jesus' humanity as he walked among them, but now they were aware of his divinity as well. How else would Jesus have been lifted off his feet and up into the clouds. We heard in verse 11 that Christ will come in the same way that he left. His return will be both as unexpected and as dramatic as the ascension was. Scripture assures that Christ will come again in the same way that he ascended. As Jesus left them, he was taken up in a cloud. The cloud often represents God's activity and presence. The disciples must have been amazed, but full of grief at the same time. Jesus had left them again. He will return, but they do not know when, and neither do we. And yet, we believe. As they looked up, they must have wondered how they would be able to continue without him. Jesus did promise to send them a helper, the Holy Spirit, but they probably wondered, as we do, where exactly is heaven? Or the right hand of God? Or where Jesus really is? We also say he's in our hearts. Maybe none of us can ever make sense of it, but even so, we believe. That's what faith is all about. We don't actually have to see in order to believe. You know, we're used to goodbyes, not exactly the way it happened with Jesus, but people around us relocate, relocate or they leave for one reason or another, and some for a short time, some permanently, we may or may not see them again. Jesus came and fulfilled his ministry here on earth, but it was time for him to go home where he rightfully belongs. Again, he did say he would come back for us, but we just don't know when that will be. We can't communicate with him the way we do uh, with so many other ways. We stay in touch with people here, However, we can stay in touch and hear his response as we pray, worship, read the Bible, and live out what it means to be the church, the body of Christ. We need Christ, and he needs us to be his witnesses and to live out his calling on our lives. David E. Leninger shared the following story. There's an ancient apocryphal story about Jesus' arrival at the pearly gates following the ascension. 
the angel host was gathered around to welcome God's son and to celebrate his return home after his incredible sojourn on earth. Everyone had questions and they couldn't wait to hear his story. Born of a virgin, raised in humble circumstances, years teaching, preaching, healing. Eventually, there was that gruesome torture and murder. But finally, the conquest of humanity's most feared enemy, death. All to share the good news of a loving God who wants nothing but the best for creation. Now the Christ is home, and everyone is exultant. Someone asks, Well, Lord, now that you are no longer physically on earth, who will continue to share the good news? Christ responds, There are 11 who are especially close to me, and I've given them the responsibility of getting the word out. Lord, these must be incredible people, the best and the brightest that creation has to offer. Well, no. Actually, no, the Lord responds. These are average folks with ordinary abilities, not the best and brightest by any means. But Lord, if these are only average people with ordinary ability, how can you be sure they will get the job done? Well, to be honest, the Lord answers, I can't be sure. You cannot be sure, Lord? Well, what if they do to, what if they fail the job? What is your backup plan? Quietly, Christ answers, I have no backup plan. Leninger then commented, I wonder if those standing there on the Mount of Olives overlooking the holy city had any idea that there was no backup plan. Well, we have no idea what they were thinking. It all had to be terribly confusing. But what about us today? It's confusing for us too, isn't it? They had actually walked and talked and ministered with Jesus, and here we are having faith without ever seeing Jesus in person. Think what it was like to watch Jesus perform miracles, watch him being crucified, and then seeing him alive again, and then just like that, he was gone again. How bewildered they must have felt. They must have been wondering, now what? Whatever are we supposed to do next? I would imagine they had no idea the difference that they would make for thousands of years to come. What if they had gone back to fishing or collecting taxes or healing the sick? Somehow, I think Jesus knew he didn't need a backup plan. He knew the 12 men he had chosen and how he taught them and equipped them to carry on his work. All but Judas, of course. But I don't think Jesus needed a backup plan. He knew what he was doing when he had chosen them and taught them and empowered them through the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Jesus chose 12 ordinary men and used them to change the world. Did you hear what the ancient story said? These are average folks with ordinary abilities, not the best and brightest by any means. And isn't that exactly who we are? Average folks with ordinary abilities. If Jesus could use these men to change the world, he can do the same thing with us if we too will drop our nets and follow him. What would have happened if the disciples went back to their former jobs? We would not be here today. Christianity would not have survived. It's important to remember, however, that the disciples were not alone. They were given the Holy Spirit. Pastor Andy will have a lot more about that next Sunday. They were empowered and they were equipped to go forth and change lives around them. And people have been doing that ever since. 
By sharing our faith with others, we too have the ability to change the world, even if it's only one person at a time. Verses 4 and 5 in Acts 1, in the new, um, the NIV version, said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Wait. One of our least favorite words. We do not like to wait. We don't like to wait in traffic, and there are many right now who do not like to wait in lines to get gas or in lines at the store. We don't like to wait for a doctor appointment or um, for birthdays or special days. Some don't like waiting to find the perfect partner to feel better or to finally find a job and so on and so on. Waiting is hard. Perhaps the hardest thing to wait for is God's perfect timing. However, God's never early or he's never late. We cannot rush ahead of him. But what did the early disciples do while they waited? They prayed. They kept on praying for 10 days. And the result was that they became of the same spirit. How often do we spend our time of waiting in prayer? Think how much better our lives would be if we followed the example of the disciples. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not go weary. They will walk and not faint. There's a time to act, and there's also a time to be still, to receive a time to listen to what God is telling us. And also, we need to be ready because we do not know when Christ is coming again. And I would like to encourage each of us individually and as a church to pray like the disciples for the guidance of the Holy Spirit for the future of the church as we wait to see what is to come in another year or so. Change is eventually coming to the United Methodist Church. Let's wait with a new strength and seek the will of God. Verse 8 in Acts 1 is the theme of Acts. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The church is so much more than a volunteer organization. It is a call to be the body of Christ. We are to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ, every part of the body. Just as one part of our physical body hurts, our whole body hurts. And when one organ of our body is not working properly, our whole body suffers. When one part of the body of Christ fails to work, the whole church suffers. What would this church look like if every single member and attender would be actively involved in some way or another? We need each other. Every one of you we need, including those of you listening via live stream, to serve as active witnesses of your faith. And the good news is that we don't have to do it on our own. And that's why we have the gift of the Holy Spirit working within us. He empowers us to do more than we could ever do on our own. Carl L. Shank reminds us that if Christ's work is to continue, it's up to us to do it. He reminds us that Jesus is no longer among us to do the things that he did on earth. He wrote, it is up to us, the body of Christ, to continue the work that if the Christ fails to be the body of Christ, if the church fails to be the body of Christ, Jesus is nowhere to be seen. His ascension reminds us of the critical nature of our role as the body of Christ. Ascension Day reminds us 
to take up Jesus' work here on earth. Jesus fulfilled his mission here on earth, and then he returned to his rightful place with God. So what are we supposed to do while we wait for Christ to return again and take us with him? Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. I like the way Eugene Peterson concluded the introduction to the book of Acts in the message translation of the Bible. He reminds us, the story of Jesus doesn't end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about were no more spectators of Jesus than Jesus was a spectator of God. They are in on the action of God. God acting in them. God living in them. Which means, of course, living in us. I don't know who first said it. I'm sure you've heard it before. I've heard it over the years that we should not be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. We will have forever to, in glory, to enjoy the glories of heaven, but right now we have work to do here on earth while we wait for Christ to come again and take us with him. You will be my witnesses. You know, witness in a court of law swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In his commentary, William Barclay wrote, the, will, the real witness is not of words, but of deeds. Then he shared the following. When the journalist Sir Henry Morton Stanley had discovered David Livingstone in Central Africa and had spent some time with him, he said, if I had been with him any longer, I would have been compelled to be a Christian and he never spoke to me about it at all. The witness of Livingstone's life was irresistible. Are people able to say that about us? Is our faith so strong and so compelling that others want what we have? You know, actions speak louder than words. Others will notice what we do and what we do is far more important than what we say. Some of those effective ways to share our faith are to share meals together, to forgive someone, to serve the community, especially those in need, to be good stewards of all that God has given to us, and in so many other ways. It is important to have faith in the Lord, but we must have faith in one another. We need each other. I think the pandemic has proven that. We need to join together constantly in prayer like the disciples did. And when we do that, we too will be powerful witnesses for Christ. We may not experience the joy of having someone accept Christ for themselves. We may not see it happen but we can still plant the seed. Someone else may water it. Someone else may pull the weeds. But we can be part of this growing process of faith in someone else's life. And someday, that faith may bloom, and another person will get to see what you started by planting that seed. We are a witness to others whether we like it or not. Whether it is at home or at school, at your job, in the church, in the neighborhood, wherever you are, you are a witness to others by the way you live your life and the way you treat others. People will notice how you spend your time and your money, the places you go and the words that you speak. People will know you are a Christian by your love. And for the last five weeks, we have talked about the importance of loving one another. Your witness matters. You may make an eternal difference in someone's life. We don't need to be able to 
answer all the theological questions or quote dozens of verses of scripture. We don't need to be a biblical scholar. We don't have to know everything. That's a relief, right? We don't have to have all the answers. We don't even have to have some of the answers. We simply need to live out our faith and love one another. If you have had an encounter with the living God, then your life is different. You don't have a choice. You are a witness. The question and the challenge are, what kind of witness are you? We also need to remember that Jesus did not say that following him would be easy. But we know it's important, meaningful, and ultimately rewarding to do so. We may need to step out of our comfort zones. But the Holy Spirit gives us the courage and the ability to do what God wants us to do. We simply need to tell people what Jesus means to us and how he has changed us. What we know about Christ is too good to keep to ourselves. His love should radiate through us to others. Christ has promised to return. He is coming back. And while we wait, let us share with others our encounters with God so that his love is known in all the places on earth. Amen. I want us to take a moment now. Um, you may either watch the screen or turn in your hymnals to number 883 as we affirm our faith with a statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. Please focus on the words and their message, particularly the ones that say what it means to be called the church. <laughs> 